I'm a frog. <laughs> Hello. I made a video that I expected about 12 people to see. It ended up being slightly more than that. Like, just a little bit. So a lot of people watched that video, and their response was, uh... They were confused, which is understandable because I did a bad job. So I'm here now to do a better job. Not a good job but a better job than what I did before. So first things first, I'm gonna start with the basics. I'm just gonna apply the like usual algorithm as you would normally expect to see it on the number 19. Just like you'd expect, you know, you multiply by three, uh, divide by two until it's odd again. And then you just do that over and over again until you finally, after applying the algorithm, you know, pretty unpredictable amount of times, you converge onto the number one. And once you've converged onto one, you can keep applying that algorithm over and over again, and you're just gonna end up back at one. As it turns out though, there's like a slightly different way that you can do this, where instead of dividing by two, after you've multiplied by three, you just include that factor of two. So this is just like a modified version of the original algorithm applied to the number 19 again. Instead of dividing by two, you just include that power of two. And the way that you do that is you multiply by three and then add by whatever power of two is a factor of the number. And the result of this is that you just sort of accumulate higher and higher powers of two. And eventually you just converge onto a single power of two without any other factors. So the, the only factor of the number is just two, the only prime factor anyways. And in doing this, what you find out is that you actually end up with the same exact path. It's just that there are powers of two attached to each number. And the algorithm still converges in the same exact way, but now instead of converging on one, it just converges on powers of two. But the really cool thing about doing it this way is now you can just apply the, al the algorithm, this modified version of the algorithm, you can apply it to fractions. And the really weird thing is you get like actually meaningful results. And to be clear, this is not the only way to apply this algorithm to fractions, I'm sure, but this is just a way to do it. And if you know a little bit about the behavior of the system, you can actually end up generating the same exact path that you would get for a particular integer, but based off of a fraction. So this is the path for a fraction that actually corresponds to the same path for 19. So when I write out this algorithm, I actually like to rearrange the equation a little bit. And these are the paths for the numbers 19 as well as 7 over 8. And what you can do is that you can actually pluck out the powers of 2 from these paths, and you can rewrite them in a descending order like this. And because of the recursive equation at the top here, you can actually just include these powers of 3 in the denominator, and then you end up uh, re basically rewriting the original number in a different form. And the reason you rewrite these numbers in this form is that when you apply the uh, algorithm to these numbers, it just sort of unfolds like a piece of paper. And as it turns out, you can kind of manipulate these powers of 2 in such a way that as long as the differences between each successive power of 2 is the same, you, uh, you end up with a number that is in some sense valid for that path length. So obviously I wrote a script that does this algorithm for me, and here is a few, and here are a few fractional examples of what are essentially equivalent paths. So what I'm showing you now is basically just to make the point that there's nothing really special about the integers. So I'm starting by just plotting the number of recursive steps for the odd integers up to 100. And they're pretty sparse and there's not really an obvious pattern there. But then when you start to include these other fractions that are still less than 100, what you end up seeing is the same exact pattern that you would see if you just plotted a bunch of odd integers. So even when you're applying this algorithm to these fractions, you, you end up seeing the same uh, weird underlying pattern. And of course, I included this definition of phi, and it was not the clearest thing. I definitely didn't do a great job of communicating what it meant. And understandably, there was a little bit of confusion around it. So now that I'm familiar with Manim, I will try to explain it again. Hopefully, it will be more clear this time. But the first thing to note is that I'm plotting these vertical lines. These vertical lines are just at the integer values of numbers that converge after the first step of the algorithm. So 5, 21, 85. As, as soon as you apply the algorithm, even a single time, you are already converged. And I'm showing some numbers that I would consider to have the same value for phi. And what I mean by that is when I draw these two lines, this red line and this blue line below it, and I take the ratio of those two lines, they come out to be the same number. 
So at this point, the question is kind of like, where did these values come from? And what I'm showing here is an example based on the number three. And all I'm doing is I'm just going forward a single step, right? So three after a single step ends up on five. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm backtracking and I'm identifying all the numbers that after a single step would end up at five. And then to the right of it, I'm showing like a simplified version of this notation that skips out on a lot of the algebra. And to the right of that, I'm showing an even simpler version of this notation. And what you end up finding out is that these numbers end up having the same value for phi. So basically they have like the same spacing in between those numbers that converge after one step. So when you take their spacing in between the numbers like five, 21, 85, 341, so on, you find that they give that same ratio of distances. Another thing that people were super confused about was kappa, which makes sense because I did a terrible job explaining it, thinking that only about seven people would see it. So what you're looking at here is a sample calculation of kappa for the number 17. So first I just write the path for the number 17 until it's converged, and then I have a value of r, which is just the number of recursive steps that it takes to converge. But I index shift in a weird way, so it's two in this case. And from here I just plug in r into the sigma equation that I showed in the previous video. And once I've plugged in r, I just need to find sigma minus and sigma plus. These are just sigma values that are immediately to the left and immediately to the right of the number that we're interested in for integer values of n. That'll make a little more sense in a second when I show it visually. But in this case, it comes out to be these two different fractions. So then I plug them into the equation for kappa and I simplify and I end up getting a fraction of 53 over 64 for 17. And another thing is that the phi of 17 is equal to three over four. And anytime I have a phi value for some integer, if I take the kappa of that phi fraction, I should end up with the same kappa value. And then another property of these kappa values is that if I take them for every integer along the path, it's always gonna be a fraction that keeps increasing until it eventually converges onto one. So this is just a visual demonstration of that same exact calculation. So the first thing I do is I just plot these sigma values. Basically, you can think of it as like a weird grid. So as I'm increasing n in the equation for sigma, this is what these points look like. They just sort of progress to the right like this. And then whenever I increase the value of r in the sigma equation, this is what these points look like. They just sort of progress upward. So anytime you plug in an integer value for n and r, you just end up with one of these orange dots. So again, I'm just visually demonstrating this calculation on the number 17. So this would be the dot corresponding to sigma minus, and this would be the dot corresponding to sigma plus. And just like phi, I'm taking the distances of my original value between sigma minus and sigma plus. And here I'm doing the same exact process, but it's for three fourths this time. So the sigma minus and sigma plus values are gonna be immediately surrounding three fourths. And I'm plotting the same distance for three fourths, but with respect to its unique sigma minus and sigma plus values. And you'll find that when I take the ratio of those two distances for both points, that they end up being the same. And this basically just means that these are essentially equivalent paths. So from here, what you can do is actually take the idea from earlier a step further. And now all I'm doing is I'm going forward two steps before I begin to backtrack instead of just one. I'm actually skipping over some values here for a reason that'll make sense in the future. But after doing all of these steps, I started with a value of 17, went forward two steps, backtracked um, in the way that I did, and I ended up backtracking to a value of 1137. And from here to the right, basically, I'm just rewriting the same path, but in like a diagram form that really condenses it. So what you're looking at here is the same exact path that's just written in a visual form. And then to the right of that, I'm again writing the same exact path, but an even more condensed form of it. Take advantage of the fact that it's very easy to calculate values of phi. And the reason that I am doing this is that that is actually the basis for the rule that I showed in the previous video. So when you take a fraction for phi, and you take the top and you multiply by 64 and add seven, and on the bottom you just multiply by 64, this is what those paths look like. This is why that works. And as it turns out, there's sort of a more general form of that rule. And what I'm drawing here are the corresponding paths for that. So with each successive diagram here, um, I'm just going forward an additional step. So in the first one, uh, you would just go forward one step and then backtrack. In the second, you know, you go forward two steps and you backtrack, third, three steps, backtrack, so on. It's pretty obvious. But the thing to pay attention to here is that when I'm backtracking, I'm backtracking by a power of three every time. And there's a really cool reason that I'm doing that, but I'm gonna save that for a future video because it's 
pretty involved. But when you do this, that idea of multiplying by 64 and adding 7 and then multiplying by 64 on the bottom, you end up finding out that that is a single example of a more general rule that looks like this. And this equation is seriously so cool, but I'm gonna have to dive into why it works and how it works in a future video. I'm also very aware that I didn't even dive into the whole psi thing, but I'm gonna need to like completely re-explain that and it's gonna have to be like a very delicate explanation for it to make any sense. Not because it's particularly difficult to explain, but because I'm a dumb person. But thank you for watching and happy Halloween.